With the announcement of the sequel to Breath of the Wild, fans across the globe went absolutely bananas in a combined display of excitement and anticipation. Years on and some heartbreaking delays later, the levels of enthusiasm for the sequel are lower than Zelda's self-esteem after another berating lecture from the King about unlocking her powers. When will you stop treating this as some sort of childish game? Man, that guy is mean. The sequel to one of the biggest and baddest games of all time, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild remains tantalizingly out of reach, but fear not my fellow Hylians because there's plenty of reasons to stay super hyped. Today, I'm going to cover off three mysteries you didn't even know about that could play a huge role for Breath of the Wild 2 come spring 2023. Number 1. What's in a map? With two days to go until the release of Breath of the Wild, anticipation was at an all-time high for Nintendo's latest entry into the series. The game offered a departure from tropes normally aligned with the franchise, with the highlights including a unique open world full of secrets and adventure. But Breath of the Wild would see another first for Nintendo in the form of a full dress down of the development at GDC, aptly titled Breaking Conventions. This hallmark presentation gave unique insights into the closely guarded secrets of game development by director Hidemaro Fujibayashi and key personnel within the team. Throughout this presentation, key moments can be pointed to that have now been infamously linked with what we see in the sequel trailers for the upcoming title, of which the most famous being the concept art of Link's arm and the new gameplay mechanics. I've covered these in past videos myself and their inclusion in the presentation, which predates the release of Breath of the Wild, strongly suggests that plans were well underway for a sequel well before fans took their first excited steps out into the Great Plateau. But one moment that is overlooked in this presentation is, is the inclusion of what I've now dubbed to be the Map of Legends. The artistic depiction of Hyrule features a layout similar to that of other games in the series, including characterizations of familiar locations and iconic characters and enemies. Yet, despite the nostalgic familiarity this map brings, it is specific to no single title. In GDC, Fujibayashi refers to the map with great reverence, right at the point when he describes his journey into building the outline for how Breath of the Wild would allow players a sense of rediscovery with the franchise, whilst also breaking the conventions that have become stale and limiting to the future of the IP. It is also suggested that the map is created by a fan, an artist's attempt to pull all of the pieces of the fantasy together in one place that make The Legend of Zelda so magical. For example, if you look around and translate the ancient Hylian script, you'll find iconic locations such as Kakariko Village, Death Mountain, Baying Wolf akin to that of Twilight Princess, and many more callbacks to previous titles such as Ocarina of Time and Skyward Sword. In his description, Fujibayashi then specifically points out three areas of the map. They are the Floating Islands, an area that, although out of place, reflects the Great Plateau of Breath of the Wild, and lastly, a cave entrance. Whilst it might be easy to shrug off the Floating Islands as a reference to past titles like the Minish Cap, Skyward Sword, or even Twilight Princess, the Great Plateau reference gives us insight into Fujibayashi's mindset when he refers to this map in particular. It represents the elements that are iconic to The Legend of Zelda, and through the eyes of Hidemaro Fujibayashi, how they are reimagined for Breath of the Wild and more notably, the future direction of the series. Applying this mentality, we can easily translate the floating islands to match what we see in the second sequel trailer, with an ancient hero-looking link traversing skybound landscapes adorned with Tori gates and shrine-like structures. The cave entrance calls to the first sequel trailer, with a blink and you'll miss it entrance to the cabins explored by Link and Zelda, lavishly adorned with imagery of Ganondorf, hiding a disturbing secret down below the depths. So what other secrets does this map hide? Maybe a leviathan-sized skeleton on the southwest corner of the Gerudo Desert perhaps? A large sea beast hinting at the waterways and lands beyond Hyrule that IG and Uma hinted at in the update to the release way back in March of this year? Or maybe a large dragon adorning Death Mountain? A hint at the aerial-based combat we know is sure to play a role in the sequel thanks to the bow-based mechanics painted by Nintendo last year. I've no doubt this map is a key item and one that holds a lot more secrets than many have given it credit for. I'd love to hear what you've noticed in the map down in the comments below. As a final point about this map, it should be noted it was first featured inside the sleeve of Zelda Encyclopedia, which was released in November of 2018. 
some 18 months after this GDC presentation and the release of Breath of the Wild. Bizarrely though, a lot of you might recognize this map from a well-known piece of merchandising, a puzzle for fans for the series sold through retailers and places like Amazon, which begs another question of course. If it was simply an artist's interpretation or the work of a fan, why would it be sold as part of Nintendo's merchandising? Simply put, what I'm saying is that this map is a creation by Nintendo for the purposes I've described. It's a reimagining of the Hyrule Fantasy post Skyward Sword and a common way to unite fans of the series into the Zelda lore. It's a merging of the old and the new, and for what it's worth, and for me anyways, it's one of the biggest clues about what we can expect in the sequel come 2023. Number 2. The New Paraglider One of the biggest questions surrounding development of the sequel to Breath of the Wild has to be about the amount of time it's taken. But when did development for the sequel begin? Well, in interviews conducted around the launch of Breath of the Wild and post-launch, IG Numa and team were asked about the plans for the future a lot. Around this time they talked quite openly around the exciting ideas that were generated during development and how many great ideas were left on the cutting room floor as there was simply not enough time to add them all in. My favourite of these is still the Minish Cap concept art, which looks simultaneously adorable and intriguing. Quite a deadly combination. One area highlighted in this discussion was the backstory of the champions, which the team were enthusiastic on fleshing out. And that of course led to the Champions Ballad DLC pack. Another was IG and Uma's insistence on something considered unusual in Zelda lore and canon, a motorbike, which led to this. Let's just say it pays to be the boss, shall we? When the sequel was eventually announced, the team at Nintendo explained they had so many ideas for the original game that it far outstripped the DLC capabilities, leading to a sequel set in the same world as Breath of the Wild, something rare for a series that generally prefers to move on to new landscapes and storylines. Now, if you believe that one of the largest video game creators in the business, handling possibly one of the most important and long-running IPs in gaming, only decided to make a sequel to Breath of the Wild after the game was released to critical acclaim, then man, I have some crypto and NFTs you might be interested in considering your high levels of enthusiasm and optimism. It would be fair to say that Nintendo haven't been around for as long as they have, without having a keen sense of business strategy and knowing the difference between a sinking ship like the Virtual Boy and a hit like Breath of the Wild. The heads at Nintendo would have had dollar signs bouncing off their enlarged pupils the second Link emerged from the Shrine of Resurrection and looked out over Hyrule Field. I can only imagine at this point they not only greenlit a sequel, but also approved that one ridiculous idea by IG and Uma to put a motorbike in the game as DLC reward for beating the mighty Mazkosha. I mean, why not, right? Evidence to this point is a piece of concept art included in the mammoth tome creating a champion, with the simplest of gaffs found in the label New Paraglider. Putting this in perspective, the accompanying artwork is reflecting the new paraglider we see Link using in the sequel trailer, not to be confused with the old paraglider Link is using in Breath of the Wild. Hold on gamesmiths, you might be saying, that's different to the one from the previous game, Skyward Sword, right? Well, no, see, Skyward Sword does not feature a paraglider, but rather a sailcloth. The paraglider, meanwhile, is gifted by the king upon completing key shrines on the Great Plateau, which enable the baseline powers of the Sheikah Slate, your digital Swiss army knife of physics breaking goodness. So if this is the first time a unique item like the paraglider features in a Zelda game, does it strike anyone else as odd to refer to it as new? My guess is that the concept art found its way into the book either due to a mistake or by design. It's a cheeky nod to hardcore nerds who spend their Friday nights researching Zelda books looking for content to make YouTube videos. I mean, not that I know anyone like that of course. Going further though, the new paraglider featured in the concept art has the streamer tassels highlighting the direction of the wind, a feature that's distinct and specific to the sequel, and something missing entirely from the first iteration of the paraglider featured in Breath of the Wild. Even the markings differ with more of a highly encrest homage included in the addition to the Rito symbol we see in the first title. So what does the new paraglider mean? Well, do the tassels showing wind direction imply a deeper connection with other titles like the Wind Waker perhaps? Maybe a return to the Wind Tribe featured in the Minish Cap. We know that the Minish were a planned part of development since removed from the game, and Nintendo were notorious for reusing planned content in a future release, so it wouldn't surprise me at all if this was the case, but what do you think? Let me know in the comments. Number 3. Dragons, Dragons Everywhere 
In the section discussing the map, I pointed out the intimidating dragon sitting high above Death Mountain, hinting at its inclusion in the sequel. As it turns out, there's more hints about dragons playing a key role in the sequel than there are little tiny Korok droppings scattered across Hyrule. I see you up there, Derek. Can't hide from me. Firstly, we have the fact that the sequel features a skydiving link breaking through the cloud barrier. An interesting tidbit of information considering the dragons from Breath of the Wild appear to be the only entities in the game who display this uncanny ability to perform the same parlor trick. Coincidence? I think not. Next we have the patents registered for gameplay mechanics by Nintendo last year mentioned earlier. These mechanics highlight a new feature to gameplay, aerial combat with a bow. Illustrations show different positions the player can engage to activate the speed of their descent, as well as engaging the bow for mid-flight combat. A new mechanism to the franchise and one that suggests aerial combat will be a distinctive element of the game. So far in the world of Breath of the Wild, the only creatures we've seen capable of reaching this altitude are the dragons, giving more credence to the idea that dragons may play an active part in the skies above Hyrule, but supporting evidence goes well beyond this. I've discussed the mysteries surrounding the heroines in my past video and a link will be provided in the description. The location of the Colossi and the Gerudo Desert are just south of Spectacle Rock. An interesting thing to note about this location and associated quests is the mystery surrounding the 8th hero, or as it's known in the west, the 8th heroine. The 7 desert colossi are arranged by means of a circle, akin to their placement in the Yiga clan hideout, a Gerudo shrine of sorts that's been usurped by the Yiga clan to form their new base of operations. Whilst this is in and of itself an intriguing mystery, the differences between the statues featured in the Yiga clan hideout and the 7 heroines in the desert is the missing 8th heroine location, creating a gap in the circle of the Goliaths in the desert. If you draw a straight line from the center of the circle through the gap, you will find yourself heading to the far southwest corner of the map and into an area that will look familiar to the fabled map I referred to earlier in the video. Here at the extreme edge of the desert, we find the Gerudo Great Skeleton, one of the three Leviathans, as well as the site of one of the Great Fairy Fountains. It is found slightly west to the Arbiter's Grounds, another significant location from Twilight Princess, which was the site of Ganondorf's failed execution and the infamous Divine Prank. This location is known as Dragon's Exile. Where the mystery really starts to become more interesting though is when you take into account the large skeletons that strew the landscape. These creatures are massive and dwarf many of the larger mini-bosses found in game like the Stone Taluses or the Hinox or Stalnox. Yet in true Breath of the Wild fashion, the origin of these large beasts and their remains is kept under wraps and never fully explained. But a piece of in-game description suggests that dragons might feature as a source of these creatures from a long time ago. It comes down to the Dragon Bone series of weapons, which are described as reinforced with fossilized bones to maximize clobbering potential. There are multiple versions of Dragon Bone gear found within the game, including the Dragon Bone bat, spear, bow, shield, and moblin club. Across the entire map of Breath of the Wild, only one other location hints to the fate of these beasts, and it's Dragon Mire, found west of Rito Village and features a behemoth-sized skeleton sunken into the quicksand-like mud, reminiscent of a prehistorical burial ground for all things giant and draconian. The other significant link, pun intended, to dragons comes courtesy of the tapestry kept by Impa in Kakariko Village, a crucial artifact used to explain the events of the ancient past. Considering the connections being made between the link we see featured in the sequel trailers and the ancient hero depicted in the tapestry, it's a reasonable conclusion to associate the depiction of Calamity Ganon from the tapestry with the likely antagonist we may encounter in Breath of the Wild 2. Centered in the tapestry, this version of Calamity Ganon appears to be more of a dragon than a pig-like beast we fought at the epoch of Breath of the Wild in the middle of Hyrule Field. Whilst all these references might appear disparate at best, the bonds become clearer when you begin to piece them together with the information to hand. We know that Calamity Ganon released a cavalcade of malice when he returned over a hundred years ago, and at some point between then and the resurrection of Link at the commencement of Breath of the Wild, the dragon Nadra had been infected with malice, comprising one of the major quests in the game to free Nadra and gain access to the Spring of Wisdom. I cover reasons for why this might be in another video, what if Zelda is the key, but considering the traversal of dragons through the Sky Barrier in Breath of the Wild, and the deep connections to Skyward Sword, it seems more than coincidental that a significant portion of the sequel will play out in the skies above Hyrule. We also have three Leviathan skeletons placed at key areas of the map which have been likened to large deities in previous Zelda titles, 
all of which are considered whale-like goliaths capable of flight and associated heavily with the spiritual journey of the hero. Of these leviathan, the skeleton found far to the north of the map shares an uncanny resemblance with that of Levias, the guardian sky spirit entrusted by Hylia and Skyward Sword to hold the secret location of the Triforce. Yet another leviathan is featured in a map released after Breath of the Wild and specifically pointed out in the Zelda Encyclopedia and the GDC about the direction of the series which is found at a location called Dragon's Exile, a site that just happens to sit exactly in line with the location of the missing 8th hero of the Gerudo Colossi. Almost like echoes of the past are literally pointing us in the direction of the biggest clue to the history of the Calamity and the Gerudo King imprisoned down in the cavernous depths of Hyrule. The fate of these great beasts is likely to have occurred in the ancient past and likely around the time of the Great Calamity illustrated in the tapestry which depicts a Calamity Ganon in what can best be described as a dragon-like form. And finally, we know from the sequel trailer that Ganon's awakening appears to culminate in an eruption of Malice driving the castle skyward, where no doubt it will act as a crucial location in events to play out in Breath of the Wild. I hope you really enjoyed this video, it's super interesting when you think about how much more there is still to be discovered in the Zelda series. A like or comment is always greatly appreciated to help get the word out and share the video with others who are excited about Legend of Zelda and keeping the hype alive for the sequel. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already and check the bell so you can get notified when a new video comes out. We are achingly close to the big thousand, so it would be great if we could cross that milestone sometime soon. A huge thanks to everyone who has supported the channel over the last six months and to the team over at our Discord channel Gamesmiths Forge. From a channel perspective, I'm working hard on trying to get more content out regularly, so expect to see more videos more often in the future as well as my first stream soon with a playthrough of Breath of the Wild. I'd like to hear from you if you're wanting to play along or if you simply haven't finished the game the first time around. So until next time, look after yourselves. Keep being amazing. We'll see you next time here on Gamesmiths.